1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. All right, and today's Chaplain's Report is going to be back in the book of 1 Samuel. We've been doing this series for, I guess, a couple months now, going through the book of 1 Samuel, and there is a wealth of information in there. Now, to sort of reset the table here, just so you know what's going on, you may recall if you were watching yesterday that Israel is about to go into battle. They've already, even though the, uh, Saul kind of jumped the gun here and disobeyed God and offered the sacrifice before he should have, the thing that you need to understand about this passage is Saul and Jonathan and the rest of Israel are all gathering together. They're about to go in and fight with the Philistines. And so about 600 men, according to the scripture, have gathered together for this battle. And this is the context in which this particular passage of scripture takes place. So let's go to 1 Samuel 13, verses 19 through 22. Now no blacksmith could be found in the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines, each to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock, his axe, and his hoe. The charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, and the axes to fit the hoes. So it came about on the day of battle that neither sword nor spear was found in the hands of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan, but they found, were found with Saul and his son Jonathan. Now, strictly as somebody that follows politics, even if I were not somebody that were interested in the Bible or its spiritual message, that is an interesting lesson in foreign policy. If nothing else, it's a fascinating lesson in a nation being self-sufficient and that being a good thing, because if you are sufficient on a neighboring nation, and, and this would be true of uh, you know individual states, it would be true of countries, you don't need to be dependent upon, especially for your military needs and equipment, another country that could turn against you, because it seems that that is what is going on here. Uh, the Philistines had blacksmiths, they had metal workers, they had people that made weapons of war. Israelites didn't. And because they didn't, the Philistines realized that they didn't have that ability to make those themselves. And so all of the people there in, in the Philistine camp was like, all right, when the Israelites come down to get their plowshares or whatever made into swords and spears, y'all don't do that you're going to charge them a ridiculous amount of money that they, they're they not going to agree to pay. And so that'll happen. And, and even if by some reason they wind up doing that, because we basically got a monopoly on weapon making here, that uh, even if they agreed to do that, okay, maybe they get spears and swords, but now we have all their money. And so we're going to bleed them of resources either way. I mean, from a battle perspective, it's pretty darn smart especially when you consider that nowadays when someone refers to someone else as a Philistine, they're basically saying that you're a caveman or an, an imbecile, something like that, a Neanderthal. But uh, the Philistines, pretty smart battle strategy here. And I think that it's, of course, a lesson in that, and it's a lesson in being self-sufficient for individual nations. There's sort of a political message here. But far more important than that, in typical Bible fashion, is the spiritual message. The spiritual message, to, uh, when you're looking at this, there is a great deal of emphasis placed on preparation and self-sufficiency. And now we're taking it outside the realm of Israel's physical struggle with the Philistines and into our spiritual struggle. There is an emphasis that is placed on those who have prepared and thought ahead and made themselves ready for battle. And in this case, I think that one lesson we could draw from this, and it is a truism of the human condition, generally speaking, maybe with a handful of rare exceptions, people do not rise to the occasion. 
maybe in some kind of limited, rare circumstance, do you have somebody that hasn't prepared, that hasn't gotten ready, that just whenever they, they step up and it's time to perform, they just bring the house down? Yeah, that happens for a handful of people, child prod, uh, prodigies, that kind of thing. But the average person, it just doesn't. And that's also something that even if you could do that, you really shouldn't rely on. There is a virtue being communicated about Israel when it comes to preparedness, when it comes to making sure you have the resources available to succeed, to protect yourself, to protect your family, and this would extend to the spiritual as well. When it comes to us and our, our fight against what the Bible calls not flesh and blood, but evil and principalities, we got to be prepared for that. Our weapons have to be ready. And it's not enough to rely on somebody else to sharpen our weapons for them. We've got to figure out ways to make our weapons sharp. In other words, to make ourselves sharp and make ourselves ready for that conflict when it comes up. The eve of battle is a really, really bad time to start planning these things. I mean, you can't just, at least they couldn't in this day, they couldn't just mass produce things on this scale that they're going to need for this battle at the last minute like this. It just can't be done. And in this case, they didn't even have a blacksmith to do that, even if they did want to try to rush everything. And so make sure you're going to have the things that you need beforehand. And, and what I tell people when they're dealing with temptation, and this is something that, of course, I struggle with on a daily basis as well, and so I'm preaching to myself here a little bit. When temptation is knocking at your door, that is a really, really bad time to start preparing for temptation. You need to have a plan ahead of time. One scripture that I'm sort of thinking of right now that this reminds me of is actually Daniel, a little bit later in Israel's history, to where it says that when it came time for he and the three men that were with him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when it came time for them to be offered the king's food and, and defile themselves, that they had prepared ahead of time, they had purposed in their heart beforehand that they were not going to allow that to happen. You see, if you don't make your mind up beforehand, if you haven't prepared for that possibility, if you haven't thought through that scenario in your head and sin and temptation shows up at your door, it's going to be a lot harder to resist. It's going to be a lot harder to sort of weave your way out of that. I think a great example would be how uh, the Mike Pence standard, which I, I know he's not the one that invented it, it's just kind of become popularized by that, that the way that he avoids sin or avoids even the appearance of sin is he doesn't have meals with or meetings with women unless his wife is present or their spouse is, is present. And so if that is the case, then you can't even come up with the appearance of impropriety. You see, you don't put yourself in those situations because somebody like Pence or, or other Christians that we can see throughout the Scripture, we can give biblical examples of people that have already made up their mind ahead of time. They have already prepared in their mind what they are going to do when placed in that situation. They've already wrapped their head around this thing. When Potiphar's wife goes after Joseph, Joseph got the heck out of there. Now, maybe Joseph is just an excellent spiritual person that was able to, in a split second, make the right decision. Maybe that's the case, but his answer doesn't seem to suggest that. Because his primary concern there was, how can I, to my master who has already put me over everything in his house, has already put me in a position of prestige and power, and has put his trust in me, how can somebody like me do something like that to him? And more importantly, how can I sin against my God by doing this thing that you're asking me to do? That doesn't sound like somebody that's making that up as he goes along. That sounds like somebody that has thought about this situation, meditated upon it, and thought about how will I, how am I going to react if X happens? How am I going to react if a, if a woman starts making advances toward me? And, and maybe, and, and this is kind of the indication that we're given from that story, that Potiphar's wife had already made some advances towards him. He had already been aware that it was possible that she was going to make that request, and so he game-planned it out in his head ahead of time as to how he was going to react. Israel should have done the same with this battle. They should have thought ahead, okay, what happens if we do have to go to war with the Philistines? Uh, well, we're going to need swords and spears, and so we should probably have at least one person in the entire country that knows how to make those. It would have been a lot further along if they had just done that simple level of uh, preparation. And the thing is, when it comes to weakness, 
when it comes to our own frailties, being aware of those things, understanding where those weaknesses are, that goes a long way in helping us to work out the kinks in our armor beforehand. That anything that we're struggling with, whether it's something like pride or lust or greed, if we're aware of those things, and we know that those are the things that are most likely to tempt us, and we can read the scripture and meditate upon those things and try to figure out, okay, how, how do I work past this? Just putting in the little bit of mental preparation it takes to do that, that's going to go a long way in making those decisions. A great example is when it comes to, to people that are young, that are teenagers, the ones that have already set up their mind ahead of time, for example, to not have sex before they're married, those tend to be the ones that don't. Because even the ones that would sort of in a... Uh, ethereal way say that they weren't going to do that if they haven't thought through those scenarios of, okay, but what happens if I wind up in this situation? It's a lot easier for them to succumb to temptation because of that. And that's true of adults as well. And so the thing that we have to remember is because this is a spiritual battle, because this is spiritual warfare and we are fighting against an enemy that seeks our souls, what we need to keep in mind is that training, training is not like cramming for a test. It's something that you have to do daily. It's something you have to be diligent about. And it's something you have to do even when you know you don't know whether or not a battle is imminent or not. You should train so you're ready for those things even when they sneak up on you. And in the same way, it's important for us to daily maintain our prayer life and reading the scripture, making sure that we're meditating upon the law of God, making sure that we're thinking through scenarios that if temptation does come towards us, how are we going to make sure that we keep ourselves pure and free from sin, at least as much as humanly possible? And so if that is the case, that's going to go a long way in helping us live a life that looks a lot more like Jesus Christ than Israel that on the eve of this big battle that they're going to have with their greatest rivals wind up caught with their pants down, metaphorically, not having swords and spears to fight in the war that they're about to go down in. Don't put yourself in that scenario. Train, prepare daily, seek after God, and that'll go a long way in preparing you for the spiritual battle of your life. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> My mother always said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid. But seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.